I'm Farah Duro, and you're listening to the PCS Revolution Podcast. Well, hello there, and welcome back. For this week's episode, I decided to do a little something different and talk about the best natural strategies to get a handle on your insulin and glucose for good. Now, today's episode comes straight out of my new PCOS Revolution 90-Day Reset Program, and I thought I'd give you a glimpse into one of my favorite lessons that we discuss in week six of the program. Now, I have to take just a little moment to brag about my new students and how very proud I am of all their progress and enthusiasm so far. So if you're listening, I am super proud of you. I can't tell you how rewarding it's been to be able to work with women with PCOS from all over the world and also to be able to see some of you in our office in Fort Lauderdale and within the new 90 Day Reset program that are listening to this podcast each and every week. So I hope you find a little more clarity in taking charge of your PCOS symptoms by addressing one of the most important and difficult aspects of it, which is your glucose and insulin imbalances. So I won't keep you waiting. Let's dig in. All right. Hello, and welcome back to lesson three of week six of the PCOS Revolution 90 Day Reset. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the oh so important ways to keep your blood sugar balanced throughout the day which is the key to overcoming the majority of your PCOS symptoms, such as irregular cycles, weight gain, mood swings, and even infertility. Now, this lesson is close to my heart because I have witnessed firsthand the effects of diabetes type 2 with my own father and have personally struggled with hypoglycemia or low blood sugar for most of my life. And I know that even if you've not been diagnosed with an insulin or glucose issue, it's likely that someone in your family probably has. Now, stay with me because we're going to be getting into the why before we talk about how to keep your glucose stable throughout the day, which is going to benefit you for the rest of your life by helping you address blood sugar imbalances head on before it turns into a more chronic issue like type 2 diabetes. Okay, so let's get started. Now, I love this quote by Joyce Meyer. I believe that the greatest gift you can give your family and the world is a healthy you. We have so much more to give and enjoy life so much more when we're healthy, right? When you hear about balanced blood sugar, you probably know it's important to your health and PCOS symptoms, but what is it really? And why is it important? And how can we keep it balanced? Well, today I'm gonna go over six simple but effective ways to balance your blood sugar and insulin levels. All right, are we ready? This is a big one, guys, and I know you're going to get so much out of it. So definitely cut off all the distractions and tune in. So let's get started. All right, we're going to talk about a little bit about what blood sugar is exactly. So blood sugar is exactly that. It's sugar in the blood. It's naturally found in many foods, especially plants. And also it's the main fuel source for your brain and muscles. In fact, our cells need sugar to work properly. Now sugar goes through the bloodstream so it can get around the entire body and reach every cell. And when a cell needs it, be it a brain cell, heart cell, muscle cell, or any kind of cell, it can be absorbed and used for fuel. So how does the sugar get into the blood? Our blood sugar levels increase after we eat, and when we eat, our digestive system starts its job to absorb as many nutrients as possible. Vitamins, minerals, water, sugar, and these nutrients go into our bloodstream to circulate throughout the body where they're needed. Sugar is very easily absorbed into the bloodstream, and this is what happens when we eat or drink things that are mainly sugar, like soda. Starches, on the other hand, are long chains of sugar. They're broken down by our digestive enzymes and are also absorbed as sugar. Now, foods high in starch are white bread and white rice. Together, sugars and starches are two of the main types of carbohydrates or carbs. And the amount that a food spikes our blood sugar has been measured for many foods. You might have heard of it. Uh, This measurement is called the glycemic index. The higher the glycemic index, the higher the blood sugar spikes after we eat it. 
So how does the body maintain sugar levels? Well, in order for the sugar in the blood to enter certain cells, it needs the hormone insulin. Now the pancreas, a gland located behind our stomach, makes insulin along with a number of digestive enzymes. And when the pancreas starts sensing higher levels of sugar in the blood, like after we eat or drink, it releases insulin to help lower that level back to normal. And the, an interesting fact here is the pancreas also makes digestive enzymes or digestive juices that help break down our food into smaller bits. And these enzymes break starches into sugars and proteins into amino acids, among other things. And our bodies absorb these smaller bits into the bloodstream as nutrients. So how does the body continue to maintain sugar levels? And I have included this little illustration to help you see what's going on actually um, with insulin. So insulin has a number of functions in the body. The most well-known one is how it helps the cells, especially our muscle cells, absorb sugar out of the blood. Well, insulin works with cells of the body like a lock and key. The cells have sugar locked out. And when insulin comes around, it acts as a key to open the lock to get the sugar into the cells. Now, as you can imagine, that lock and key fit perfectly into each other. If there is a bit of blood sugar, your muscles and other cells will be able to absorb it easily once the locks are unlocked. <laughs> they will use or burn what they need at the time and store the rest for later. So we are incredibly efficient, right? Uh, your body doesn't want to waste essential nutrients, so it stores it for times when food may become scarce. And this is how our bodies were designed to work. But something happens when things go wrong. And there's, you know, a quote by an unknown person saying, nothing looks as good as healthy feels. But if our blood sugar levels are too high too often, this can put stress on our pancreas. And since it's always checking blood sugar levels, it's always ready to release insulin. Over time, what eventually happens is that the cells start ignoring insulin's calls. And that's just like, you know, they go to voicemail, right? And insulin becomes like that annoying person who keeps coming to the door, asking it to open. Eventually, you just can't be bothered to open that door anymore. This is called insulin resistance, and it's the first step toward developing type 2 diabetes. And it's extremely common with PCOS, as we know. So here's a little illustration of the cycle of insulin resistance. And what happens is uh, when the cells become resistant to insulin, the pancreas ramps up production of insulin to try to get their attention even more. And insulin resistance adds fuel to the fire. At this point, the blood levels are of both sugar and insulin are really high, and the body eventually loses its ability to maintain balanced blood sugar. Eventually, our pancreas could get overworked and it just stops making insulin. Now, excess weight, especially around the middle, like belly fat, is a sign of insulin resistance. And this is how type 2 diabetes starts, when the body becomes resistant to insulin, or when the pancreas stops making enough insulin. So basically, in a nutshell, this is what happens. Uh, this is how our bodies regulate sugar. Our digestive system breaks down and absorbs sugar from sugary or starchy foods, and high blood sugar causes our body to respond. Now, our pancreas releases insulin into the bloodstream to help our cells absorb that sugar. And if things stay too high for too long over time, our cells start ignoring insulin's call. They become resistant. And this causes our blood sugar to remain high because insulin's call to lower blood sugar is being ignored. Our pancreas ramps up insulin production even higher to overcome this. And we eventually end up with high blood sugar and high insulin. Our pancreas eventually gets tired and slows down production of insulin and this leads to even higher blood sugar. So one problem is that standard medical tests are failing to detect the root causes of blood sugar issues before they become full-blown conditions. And we notice this almost every week in our clinic. So to be clear, blood glucose and hemoglobin A1C testing are valuable, but the fasting insulin test is ideal for predicting early signs of blood sugar trouble. Now, as usual, when it comes to your insulin levels, we aim for optimal functional levels, not just normal or high normal levels. And after what you just learned, you can probably see why uh, uh, you don't want to be at the edge of uh, pre-diabetic or, or diabetic when you find out, right? 
So optimal fasting insulin, uh, we, we consider optimal fasting insulin levels to be less than eight or even better around four or five. And this means you're not creating a high insulin demand, creating inflammation or promoting fat storage. Your body is producing insulin at optimal levels. Higher levels than eight definitely indicates some degree of insulin resistance. And this means that the cells in your body have become resistant to insulin's effort to get sugar inside of our cell, like we talked about, where it can give us energy. And to review, the pancreas tries to overcompensate by flooding the body with an increasingly higher levels of insulin in order to force your cells to open up and take the sugar. It's like getting a little kid to eat. <laughs> it doesn't want to eat. And this is another marker whose standard reference range, which remember is just a statistical norm capturing the average American status, reflects the ac- epidemic of disease currently present in our culture. So um, sometimes the labs will not flag uh, the suboptimal levels, uh, depending on where you get your test done. But um, definitely aim for between four or five with your insulin. Now, why is it important to maintain stable blood sugar? And someone once said, take care of your body. It's the only place you have to live in. So true. So blood sugar problems can lead to the chronic condition called diabetes. And diabetes can have many serious consequences. So some of them are blindness, kidney failure, amputation, and nerve problems, to name a few. And diabetes can also lead to heart disease, heart attacks, and strokes. And this is because high blood sugar over time damages the blood vessels inside our body. So another statistic that's not so pretty is that more than half of women with PCOS develop type 2 diabetes by age 40. And I'm here to tell you that we are going to change that. Uh, This is why I've included so much information on blood sugar and insulin in this program. So um, we are not going to be part of that statistic, right? (laughs) And also, if you have subclinical hypothyroidism, which is a TSH over 2 million international units per liter, this can exacerbate insulin resistance in women uh, with PCOS, independent of age and BMI. So even if you're not overweight, uh, if you have any issue with your thyroid, it can it can exacerbate insulin resistance. So that's why it's important to address your thyroid and your insulin and blood glucose at the same time. So according to Harvard Health, another not wonderful statistic is about two thirds of people with diabetes will eventually die from heart disease, stroke, or other cardiovascular problems. And there's a number of factors that can contribute to insulin resistance. And this includes being overweight, having a family history of diabetes, having had diabetes during pregnancy, having high blood pressure, increasing age. So ask your doctor about having your blood tested, especially if you have those risk factors and definitely you need to test your insulin and your glucose if you have PCOS on a yearly basis. So let's talk about optimal glucose ranges. Uh, We talked about insulin and now for glucose, it can vary according to time of day and if you've eaten or not. So a normal fasting, which means no food for eight hours, blood sugar level is between 70 to 99 milligrams per deciliter. And a normal blood sugar level two hours after eating is going to be less than 140 milligrams per deciliter. So you just want to make sure if you're, if you have a glucometer at home and you're testing, um, it's going to make a huge difference if you have eaten or not. And I recommend doing it right when you wake up too, which is also very good. And also uh, after you eat, so performing both of these tests. And what can signal prediabetes? So prediabetes is diagnosed by any one of the following. Uh, A fasting blood glucose between 100 and 125 milligrams per deciliter and an A1C between 5.7 and 6.4% and any value between 140 milligrams per deciliter and 199 during a two hour 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test. Now your doctor can order this for you if you've never had this done. And it's usually done during pregnancy as well for any woman usually who's pregnant, whether you have PCOS or not, but especially if you have PCOS, you want this test to be done. 
Now, when we talk about a fasting insulin test, it's truly one of the most simplest, most affordable, and most accurate tests available to detect a trend towards pre-diabetes. And call it the pre, pre-diabetes test because it measures your insulin levels, which typically become imbalanced long before glucose or hemoglobin A1C levels show up as abnormal. And here's how it works. Most doctors screen patients for diabetes with the fasting glucose test. And if that comes back normal, which it so often does, and it will come back normal quite a bit with PCOS, then they tell you you're good to go. Have you guys heard that before? Oh yeah, everything's normal. <laughs> but the truth is, you're in your body's infinite wisdom, it will often compensate for blood sugar issues by raising insulin levels to keep your blood glucose and your hemoglobin A1C in check. So when your doctor runs that fasting glucose test and everything looks fine, in reality, you could be trending towards a blood sugar issue already. And the fasting insulin test is one of the best ways to detect this early on. So here are some common symptoms of insulin resistance. We'll definitely see weight gain around the middle, especially like a a spare tire, in fact they call it, and uh, obesity, fatigue, or lack of energy after eating, and feeling best when eating frequently, like every two hours, to keep up the energy. We'll also see, of course, hormonal imbalances like PCOS and infertility in women, acne, craving carbs like pasta, bread, sweets, and sweetened beverages, and hypoglycemic episodes like feeling shaky, weak, and emotional from low blood sugar. Well, the problem is that about one in three American adults have prediabetes and most don't even know it. So, you know, I would say not just for PCOS, but in general, it's so good to have an annual, include that on your annual checkup, a um, fasting glucose and insulin test, right? And that's because there are often no obvious symptoms. So... Let's get ready for a little good news, okay? According to Harvard Health, if your blood sugar is on the high side, you don't need to make drastic changes to see improvements. Plus, healthy diet and exercise can also improve other areas of health like your heart health, brain health, mental health, reproductive health as well. And so number one, we're going to say definitely to avoid foods and drinks that are mainly sugar. And someone once said, eat less sugar, you're already sweet enough. (laughs) So we know that sugar is not a health food. It's not a great source of nutrition. And certain foods and drinks are mainly sugar. And this means that they can easily spike up blood sugar levels. And this includes things like soda, juice, many desserts, some breakfast cereals, and mostly processed food. So eating too much sugar is linked with insulin resistance, diabetes, and high levels of internal body fat stores. So here's a tip, sugar hides in lots of foods. Check your labels to look for sugar near the beginning of the ingredients list. And ingredients are listed with the first ingredient being the highest amount in the food and the last ingredient, the lowest. So sugar can also be on the label as many things, including glucose, fructose, and dextrose, and all kinds of other names. So just be aware of that. Number two would be to reduce refined carbs. And, you know, with refined carbs, uh, definitely they have a very high glycemic index. So they definitely spike blood sugar hard and fast. It's not fun. And these foods include white rice and foods made with white flour. So a lot of your white foods are not so great for our uh, glucose and insulin levels. And number three, when you eat starchy foods, eat them with protein and fiber. It's my favorite because uh, absorption of sugar happens a bit slower after a meal that also contains protein, fat, and fiber. And the protein, fat, and fiber can help to lessen that blood sugar spike after eating. Now, foods high in protein include meat, fish, and eggs. And foods high in fiber include fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and legumes. So it's definitely super important if you are going to have... a little starch, then definitely include uh, a good bit of protein with that. And number four is becoming one of my favorites, exercise. So many studies have linked physical inactivity to insulin resistance. And since our muscle cells burn a lot of blood sugar as fuel, moving them will help burn even more. This is so important. And we're going to get into this in uh, next week, actually. Our whole uh, week is devoted to exercise. So uh, we're really going to get into why this is so helpful as well for, for PCOS. And number five, 
is to uh, really just lose weight, which I know sounds very oversimplistic, but um, we know that being overweight with PCOS can worsen insulin resistance and prediabetes. So it's because the fat tissue on our own bodies release hormones and inflammatory substances, and these can contribute to insulin resistance. So our fat tissue acts as an organ that actually interferes with our insulin. And of course, losing weight is ideal, but it's not absolutely mandatory. You know, we we um, often see sometimes that we have patients who have uh, insulin and glucose issues that are not overweight, and and sometimes after losing those uh, losing weight, if you are overweight, um, there might still be an issue. So we definitely want to address the weight because it will help tremendously with balancing your glucose and and your insulin levels. But know that if you don't have weight to lose, you still need to pay attention to this number. And number six, seek additional help if needed. So don't. Have hesitate to uh, talk to your doctor or your provider. Um, if you're still having issues keeping your insulin and glucose balanced after your checkup and it's just not coming down, you, you need to speak uh, about some options. And, you know, definitely there's a prescription called metformin um, that you can try. And there's also an herbal uh, remedy called berberine that can help, but don't take them together. It's one or the other because both of them are doing the same thing. And check under the resources section under PCOS supplements if you need more information about about berberine. It's under metabolic XR, actually by pure encapsulations. And I've included a link in the resources section to, to help you with that. But speak to your doctor, please, about before you take either of these, because we want to make sure that everything you're doing is working together and not working against you. And you know, the, another good news, I, I think that, you know, we don't want to dwell on the negative that um, there's so many good things about what this program is going to be doing for you, but uh, in, in this 90 days, but um, the diabetes prevention program study showed that cutting 150 calories per day and walking briskly for 30 minutes, five days a week, cut the risk of developing diabetes by more than half. So 58%. And health is not just about being disease free. I love this quote. Are you ready for this? It's when every cell in your body is bouncing with joy. And I just want to end with that because uh, our idea of health is very different. Um, it's not just the absence of disease, right? So by improving your diet and lifestyle habits like I covered today, you're not only going to help balance your blood sugar, but you're also going to help improve so many other aspects of your health and wellness, including addressing your PCOS for the rest of your life. Now, I encourage you to discover how best to regain control of your blood sugar and insulin and make sure to discuss this with your provider about how to get regular checkups so you don't let it creep up on you. And let me know what's working for you when you start implementing these strategies. So I really can't wait to hear your progress, guys, and have fun with this. I will be chatting with you in our Facebook group about this. Uh, and good luck. Let me know if you need any help at all. And I will see you for our exercise portion next week. Now, if you enjoyed listening to this episode, and I hope you have, you have to check out the PCOS Revolution Academy 90 Day Reset, where we go through all of these topics in an easy to follow, totally online, step-by-step -step process, so you can stop giving PCOS the upper hand. Join me over at thepcosrevolution.com to find out more about how you can sign up for our next program and also get access to some very cool freebies that I've created for you. I'd love to have you join me inside of the Academy. See you there and have a wonderful week, guys. Thanks so much for listening and see you soon.